Okay, so this lecture is actually going to be based on quantum numbers and the discovery of quantum mechanics by Erwin Schrödinger. So if you don't remember quantum numbers or maybe you didn't cover it last year, I would highly recommend that not only you watch this video, but also take a look at section 6.5 and 6.6 .6 in your book. So after World War I, Erwin Schrödinger was a scientist, um, more specifically he was a physicist, um, who was trying to develop a way to describe how waves and electrons and particles all went together. Um, and so what he did is he developed a mathematical treatment that both the wave and the particle nature of matter could be incorporated together. And this is actually known as quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics ha is a huge field in physics, and we're not going to cover many physics topics at all, so if you really enjoy quantum mechanics, you can take another class once you get to college. So Schrodinger developed this idea of wave mechanics, and that's the big basis for quantum mechanics. And what he did is he just treated the electron as if it were a wave. And so this was all mathematically done. So he actually created this large, large equation uh, in which he considered the region of space in the atom where the electron will most probably be located. So because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, he knew that he could never specifically tell where an electron was, so he now looked at statistics and looked at probability. And so this is what we're going to be focusing on is the probability of finding an electron and not the specific location of the electron itself. So Schrodinger's equation resulted in solutions that are called wave functions, which are chemically important, but the math involved in finding wave functions, which is what you can see here on the screen, it's very complicated, it's far beyond the scope of this course, and so luckily for us, the results are a little bit easier to understand than the math itself. So we're going to focus on the conceptual ideas from this um, equation rather than the equation itself. So what Schrodinger did is he worked with the wave equation, and the wave equation is designated with the lowercase Greek letter psi, um, which kind of looks like this pitchfork. Um, and psi really had no meaning. But the square of psi, so psi squared, gives us this probability map of where an electron is most probably located in an atom. So in English, the wave function tells us the energy of the electron is located uh, within a specific area, and it's all about probability. So we can say it's probably located in a specific area. So if we look at this example right here, we can see the XYZ coordinate system, but notice that it's very dense right here in the middle. That is the probability of where we will find an electron. So when we solve this wave equation that Schrodinger developed, it actually gives us a set of wave functions, which are also known as orbitals and it also gives the corresponding energy of the orbital. Now, each orbital describes the distribution of the electron density. So that is the region of space in an atom where it is very highly probable that we can find an electron. And it's something important to remember that orbitals are functions. So orbitals are actually math functions compared to orbits that we talked about with the Bohr model. Um, the quantum mechanical model does not refer to orbits at all because the electron cannot be precisely determined, as Heisenberg said in his uncertainty principle. So when we look at orbitals, we're actually talking about math functions. And so what we actually need to describe these orbitals are quantum numbers. So an orbital can be described by a set of three quantum numbers, three major quantum numbers. We'll look at four, but for now we're going to focus on the three major quantum numbers. First we have n, so this was the very first one, and then we also will look at l and m sub l. So the first quantum number is n, that's the principal quantum number, and this indicates a specific energy level. So we're looking at n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. This is the overall energy level. And this also indicates the relative size. 
the larger value of n, the larger the shell you're going to have because you're going to have more orbitals and more subshells within that overall energy level. Um, the higher value of n also means that your electrons are much further from the nucleus. So this also will indicate the energy because the larger value of n, the further from the nucleus you are, the higher the energy. So the values of n, and this is important, the values of n are anything 1 or greater. Okay, they have to be integers, can't be 1.5. It'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, so on. So the next quantum number that we're going to focus on is L. And this is the angular momentum quantum number. So this quantum number defines the shape of the orbital, which also gives us the specific sublevel. So the allowed values of L are any integers ranging from 0 to n minus 1. So if n is 4, then our values of L could be 0, 1, 2, or 3. So we actually use letter designations to communicate these different values of L because those are the different sublevels. So you can have your S, your P, your D, your F, and so on. And that's much easier for us to distinguish than the shapes of orbitals. So like I just mentioned, the value of L is designated by a letter. So if L is 0, which is the least that it can be, that means you're in an S sublevel. If it's 1, it's P, 2 is D, 3 is F. If we were to have a value of 4, that would be G, and then we start to just go in alphabetical order. So again, this is useful for us to, dis to distinguish or to designate the specific sublevel that we're in. So the third quantum number that we look at is m sub l. This is the magnetic quantum number. So this actually describes the orbital itself. So it's the three-dimensional orientation of the orbital. <clears throat> so these allowed values are any integers ranging from negative l to positive l. So anything from negative l to positive l are our values for m sub l. Um, therefore, on any energy level, we can have 1s orbital, 3p orbitals, 5d, 7f, and so on. So this is actually very useful when we start drawing the um, orbital diagram. So let's say this is p. Let's say this is a p sublevel. Let's say it's 2p. Okay, so what this actually means is this has a designation of 0, this has the designation of 1, and this is negative 1 because L, in this case, is 1, right? N would equal 2, L would equal 1, because we are in the P, which means M sub L can be negative 1 to positive 1. So when we look at these quantum numbers, it's important to know that any orbital that has the same value of N forms what's called a shell, or an energy shell. So for example, all of the orbitals that have n equals 3 are in the third energy shell. Then sets of orbitals that have the same value of n and l are a subshell. So each subshell is designated by a number and a letter. So for example, the orbitals that have n equals 3 and l equals 2 are the 3d orbitals. So these are the, this is the 3d subshell or sublevel. It is also important to know that when you are ready to put electrons into any sublevel, you can put 2n squared electrons into an energy level. So if n equals 1, then we can put 2 times 1 squared, which is just 2, into the first energy level, which is why we can only have a 1s. If n equals 2, we're going to do 2 times 2 squared. So we have 8. We can put in 8 electrons into the 2s and the 2p. So that's important to remember as we start looking at our orbital diagrams and our electron configurations. So here's just a table that is actually table 6.2 in your book on page 229. And this shows your possible values of n, l, the subshell designation, your possible values of m sub l, and then it shows you your orbitals and 
um, your total number of orbitals in the shell. So this is really important to look at to make sure that you know how to determine N, L, M sub L and go from there. So what we're going to look at now are each of the individual orbitals and we're going to look at the shape and different designations. So with an S orbital, this is the simplest orbital that we can have. The value of L for an S orbital is zero. So if L is zero, you have an S orbital. They are spherical in shape, so you can see three examples here, the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s. And notice that as n gets bigger, the radius of the sphere also gets bigger. So if we look at a graph of probabilities of finding an electron versus the distance from the nucleus, we actually see that these s orbitals possess what are called nodes. Now the number of nodes is based on the value of n because it is an n minus 1 for number of nodes. So a node is a region of space where there is a 0% probability of finding an electron. So if you take a look at each of these graphs, the 1s has 0 nodes. The 2s has one node right here. So what that means is in this one single space, there is 0% chance of finding an electron. The 3s has two nodes and so on. So if you actually read in your book, it actually goes much more into depth on looking at these probability graphs and discussing the nodes. So the second orbital that we look at are the p orbitals. So s orbitals were the simplest, now we come to the p orbitals. The p orbital is designated by the l value of 1. So if l is 1, you're in a p orbital. So p orbitals have two lobes with a node in between them. So if we look at this graph all the way on the left, there are two lobes of probability, but right here in the middle is a node. So there's a 0% chance probability of finding an electron really at the origin. So what we can actually say is that these have a dumbbell shape. So there's a dumbbell on each axis. Then after the p orbital, we come to the d orbital. So the d orbital has a value of 2 for L. And with these d orbitals, we're not going to worry about the shape because they start as dumbbells, but then they get a little bit more complicated um, as we progress through the axes. So we're not going to worry about the shape, but it is important to remember that the value of L is 2. And the higher the value we get in terms of n, so 3d to 4d to 5d, the higher value of n, the more energy it's going to have. So if you compare 3d to 4d, 4d is going to have higher energy than 3d. And then finally we have the f orbitals. So when you have a value of L equal 3, you actually are working with the f orbitals. Now the f orbitals are pretty complex, so we're not going to worry about the shape again, but f orbitals only start when you are at n equals 4. So if you're at n equals 4, that's when you will start the 4f orbitals. Otherwise, you're not going to have the f orbitals there. So in Bohr's model of the hydrogen, there's just one electron. So when you have a one electron hydrogen atom, energy levels are called degenerate. That means they have the same energy. So whether you are at a 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, Anything in the same energy level, so all n equals 2 has the same energy, all n equals 3 has the same energy. That is just in hydrogen, because there's only one electron. So in hydrogen atoms, all of the energy levels are degenerate. So the energy levels in a hydrogen atom are degenerate. But as the number of electrons increase, we also have the repulsion between them increasing. So in many uh, multi-electron atoms, orbitals on the same energy level are no longer degenerate. So what this means is 2s is lower energy than 2p, or 3s is lower than 3p, which is lower than 3d. So no longer are each of the shells degenerate. Now there's actually a distinction between energy levels. So it was discovered that two electrons in the same orbital do not have exactly the same energy. So even though you have two electrons in the 2s, those two electrons have different energies. And that's because the spin of an electron 
actually affects its energy, which means we now have to take that into account. So because of this idea of electrons in the same orbital having different energies, this led to a fourth quantum number. And this fourth quantum number is called the spin quantum number, which is m sub s. Now the spin quantum number is pretty easy because it can only have two allowed values, either plus one half or minus one half. And so what this means is if we have, an, let's say, the one s orbital, we have two electrons, one, two. This first one that's pointing up will be positive one half. This one that is pointing down will be negative one half. Those are your only possibilities. And so this fourth quantum number leads us to a couple new vocabulary words that you might not, might not be familiar with. So this first one is paramagnetic. So paramagnetic is an atom with one or more unpaired electrons. So if you have electrons alone in an orbital, this is a paramagnetic atom. So let's say we have, here's a 2p orbital. Let's say we have four electrons in it. And notice we have two unpaired electrons here. This is a paramagnetic atom. Diamagnetic is an atom with only paired electrons. So if we have every orbital filled, that's going to be a diamagnetic atom.